Hi everyone, welcome to Women in ML. My name is Priya Mathur and I'm the head of AI ML in Device and Services at Google. In this workshop, we learn how to unlock the power of generative AI. Generative AI has taken the world by storm with its revolutionary potential to improve every area of work and life. In this workshop, you learn how generative AI works and learn techniques to utilize its power. These techniques will help you increase your productivity, improve customer experience, increase profits at work. At life, it will give you a virtual personal assistant to help you focus on things that matter to you more. Artificial intelligence or machine learning is a broad umbrella term. It comprises of four categories. But first, let's understand what AI or ML is. It's a field of study where machines learn patterns from data without explicit programming or without teaching them any rules or logic. The first category within uh, AI is supervised learning, where machines learn from labeled or tagged data to predict future values. It could be stock prices, it could be uh, future sales, many things that you want to predict numerically. The second category is unsupervised learning, where machines learn from raw, unlabeled data to classify or cluster data. For example, it is used for customer segmentation or market segmentation. The third category is deep learning. These models are much advanced than shallow machine learning models that we have in supervised and unsupervised learning. This category includes neural networks that solve complex patterns than traditional ML models. They consist of layers of neurons that mimic human brain, and which is why they are able to understand complex patterns. We'll talk more about deep learning in the following sl uh, slides. The last category is generative AI, which is also deep learning or neural network models trained on large data set. The most exciting part about generative AI is that it can mimic human understanding and can generate content. We learn more about generative AI, the last category in focus for this workshop in the coming slides. So what's uh, an LLM or a large language model? In simple words, it's a neural network trained on large data sets. We are talking about trillions of text, images, audio, and video. It can detect complex patterns for varied sources of data. They're also known as transformers, with a set of encoders and decoders and layers as we have in neural networks. It models the frequency distribution of the data it is trained on. For a given input, let's say it's raining cats and the model uh, predicts what the next word is going to be. What it finds is that dogs has been most used word in its training data, so it predicts dogs. It's raining cats and dogs. Basically, this is the world's most fancy autocomplete. It takes text as input and outputs text, sometimes as long as a book for the most recent elements. Now let's understand what is large LLMs or large language models. There are three things that are large. One is the training data. There are trillions of tokens of text, images, audio, and video that they're trained on. It's entire corpus of web data. The second big thing is parameters, and we'll talk more about parameters in the next uh, few slides. The parameters are sometimes 340 billion, 1.7 trillion for the latest large language models. There are many, many parameters as compared to traditional ML models. And the third thing that is large is uh, resources required to train these models. Very, very expensive deep TPUs, also known as tensor processing units, and we, you require many of them. Talking about parameters, what do they mean? Neural networks are algorithms that have multiple layers of neurons and nodes between input data and output. Remember I said they mimic the human brain? We have millions and billions of neurons in our brains. Similar to that, neural networks have many, many neurons. Once the model is trained on large data sets, 
each neuron in the model represents some aspect, some feature of the input training data. It represents uh, uh, the aspects in form of weights and biases. Model weights are called parameters of the LLM that contain complex patterns. Parameters are directly proportional to the number of neurons in the model. So let's learn why are generative models so important. There are three characteristics to them. One, they have emergent abilities. They have the ability to perform tasks that they're not trained on. The second characteristic is that they understand context just like humans do. And I have more to talk about context in the coming sections. And this ability to understand context changes the way we interact with them. The third characteristic is that they can find patterns and connections in massive and different data sources. Simple regression models could find patterns, simple patterns. Neural networks could find patterns in massive data sets, but not in varied data sets, which is what makes large language models different and unique. We had an iPhone moment last year with the launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI. It took the world by storm. Right, so it became the fastest growing app with 100 million weekly active users. But it all actually started with a research paper called Attention is All You Need by Google researchers in 2017. This paper contains how large language models can be taught to pay attention to certain words of the input sequence, much like humans do. This made possible processing of longer sequences and solved the memory issues of previous model. This paper was a game changer in the field of AI. Post-launch, now we have many popular foundational large language models. We have Gemini by Google, the most recent one. We have Llama by Meta. We have Claude by Anthropic, and we have ChatGPT. Some of these models are private and some are public. The private models, some of them that are mentioned here, they are developed and owned by large funded companies like Google, Meta, OpenAI, etc. They are paid models and developers need to pay to access them. The open source models, however, are also developed by large companies but open source to dev community. They provide more flexibility and are free to developers to create applications. As we talked about the large language foundational models, Google just announced Gemini models this week. These are multimodal models with powerful capabilities across image, audio, video, code, and text domains. Gemini Ultra, which is rolling out early next year, is the first model to outperform human expert performance on MMLU across various subjects with a score above 90%. Now you might be wondering, what is MMLU? It stands for Massive Multitask Language Understanding. It's a new benchmark for evaluating models exclusively in zero-shot and few-shot settings. This makes the benchmark more challenging and more similar to how we evaluate humans. The benchmark covers 57 subjects across STEM, humanities, social sciences, and more. It ranges in difficulty from an elementary level to an advanced professional level and test both world knowledge and problem solving ability. The granularity and the breadth of the subjects makes the benchmark ideal for identifying a model's blind spots. Gemini will be available in three sizes, Ultra, Pro, and Nano. Ultra is going to be available for developers and it's gonna be a general purpose foundational model. Pro will be for enterprises and Nano for uh, running uh, large language models for devices. Generative AI will revolutionize the way we live and work with applications across many industries. It has applications in visual content generation, audio generation, text generation, and code generation. It can be used to create chatbots. It can be used to create editing uh, agents. It can be used for translation video prediction, creating scripts, and so on. Generative AI has going to have an impact on every area of work and life. 
For us to be able to leverage its power, we need to understand few techniques, which includes prompt engineering tips, and which is what we're going to learn in the next few slides. What you see here is BART to the right and using Palm as a developer to the left. BART is a front end which has an application layer between the user and the large language models. Application layer takes care of serving the models, integrating the models with uh, external data sources as well as other uh, applications. However, to the left, what we see is using uh, the large language model powering BARD as is. It's not the same. There are many ways of doing prompt engineering. One way is doing role prompting. An example would be, hey, you are a senior Google software engineer with knowledge and experience in every machine language which is where you are providing the role the generative AI or large language model to play. You can ask it to play a, a role at work or at life. And this technique is called role prompt prompting. So there are three frameworks for prompt engineering. Prompt engineering, or also known as prompt tuning, is done to reduce the hallucinations of large language models, also to improve the accuracy of these models. With uh, the three formats I'm going to talk about, you will be able to get a generative AI or large language model to perform the task you want it to. The first format is role task format, in which you assign the role you want the large language model to play. Task is what task they should be doing, and format is what should be the format of the response. An example uh, prompt in this format would be, you're a senior software engineer with knowledge and experience in every machine la language. Your task is to finish this uh, Python code. And you can also provide the format that your format should be simple. The second framework is context task format. In this format, you provide context other than uh, the role to the large language model. Example, product X just launched, along with task and format, similar to the first framework. And the last uh, framework is role, context, task, example framework, where, which is a combination of the first two frameworks with additional examples and even steps sometimes. Providing examples along with role and context is also known as few shot prompting. So why do we do few shot or zero shot? What does zero shot mean? Zero shot prompting means you give a prompt to a large language model with no examples. For example, what is the capital of India? That's just a question with no examples. That's zero shot prompt. Few shot means you ask a question or a prompt, but along with that, you provide few examples. Providing examples in the prompt increases the likelihood of a model giving you correct answers. In a way, it, will, it is decreasing the likelihood of large language models to hallucinate. So few shot prompting only improves the accuracy of model responses. There's another framework, chain of thought. Chain of thought framework was developed by research at Google that found that large language models perform better when you ask them to show their work or explain their reasoning, much like humans do. It works particularly well with few shot. Let me give you an example. In standard prompting, if you ask what is two plus five, it is not guaranteed that the large language model will give you seven as an answer. That's standard for prompting with no examples, zero shot. In chain of thought prompting, if you said, what is two plus, two plus uh, five? Uh, and give some examples of one plus one equals to two, two plus three equals to five, then it, uh, then it will be able to understand how to do addition and how to arrive at the right answer, which is seven. This chain of thought prompting is th making large language models think in steps. Break down the question into a couple of uh, steps and arrive at a solution. That's chain of thought prompting. Another very important characteristic of large language models, which we do not see when we use BARD in our day-to-day -day life is temperature. Let's understand what temperature is. 
uh, temperature is how consistent do you want a large language model to be? If the range of temperature uh, is between zero and one, the low temperature between zero and 0 0.3 means you want large language model responses to be more focused, coherent, and conservative, meaning more factual. Low temperature meaning factual responses. If the model does not know the answer, it will return, I don't know. The medium temperature strikes a balance between creativity and factuality. Uh, in most applications, we try to have medium temperature. The last uh, value a temperature can have is between 0.7 and 1, which means you want a model to be creative. And this really comes helpful when you're writing scripts or when you are uh, uh, writing stories for your articles. You want it to be more creative than factual. So with all these prompt tuning techniques, let's understand what prompt tuning is. Prompt tuning is increasing the accuracy of the model, reducing its hallucinations by providing context to the model. And how do we provide the context? We provide context by using the frameworks we talked about, we, uh, by uh, giving examples, uh, is how we improve the context. We are not fine tuning or training the model in prompt tuning. It is just adding a context, which is a soft prompt to the model with all the model weights we talked about frozen. So there's no retraining the model. There's no PhD required to be able to uh, do prompt engineering that can help us get our job done. Now that we've learned prompt engineering techniques to leverage the power of generative AI, I encourage everyone to go create AI agents using BARD, my favorite, my personal favorite, or other chatbots. Thank you so much.